Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for the Bible study this evening. Uh, the, this particular study is pre-recorded. Uh, Gavin is not able to be with us this evening because he and Sinead are in the United States, and he asked me to step in and do the study for him. Tonight we're going to look at a subject which is a, a well-known subject for all of us, we who believe in Jesus. Uh, it may seem like it's old territory, uh, but sometimes I think it's useful to review our thinking on certain matters. Uh, and the study is entitled tonight, Who is Jesus? Very simple study. It's not going to take a long time. Uh, but please join me as we go through some of the ideas from Scripture. Let's begin by praying together. Please join me in prayer. Great, wonderful Father, once again we, we need you in all that we do. We thank you that your presence is ever with us. We thank you for the abiding of the Holy Spirit within us. We thank you for the way that the Holy Spirit directs us to Jesus, your Son. Help us as we look into the study tonight to look into your scriptures and to be inspired by you and we commit this study to you, and this we do in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by giving us some quotations on the subject of who is Jesus. Uh, you'll recognize some of the theologians that will be mentioned. Uh, some I know are familiar to most of us here uh, within our fellowship. So let's just begin with the, the first quotation. Uh, oh, and by the way, just in case you uh, wonder, uh, what we will be stressing. We will be stressing that Jesus Christ is the center of our theology. He is at the center uh, of theology within our denomination. And the images throughout, there's only two, uh, are used by permission of the Glasgow Art Gallery and they're taken from uh, Salvador Dali's painting of Christ of St. John of the Cross. Let's get to the first quotation. This is from a book called Christian Theology, an Introduction, uh, published in 1997 by Alistair McGrath. So here is the, the quotation. The person of Jesus Christ is of central importance to Christian theology. Whereas theology could be defined as talk about God in general, Christian theology accords a central role to Jesus Christ. If you were to sign up for a class in theology, chances are uh, you might discuss other concepts of God other than the God as revealed through Jesus Christ. So this is what uh, we are stressing tonight. Uh, we're not just going to talk about theology in general, we're going to talk about Christian theology, and at the center of Christian theology is Jesus Christ. To continue the quotation, uh, Christianity is not a set of self-contained and freestanding ideas. It represents a sustained response to the questions raised by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is regarded as making God known in a particular and specific manner, distinctive to Christianity. So it's important to note that when we consider Christian theology, we're seeing something which is distinctive, and that distinction is all to do with Jesus Christ. Let's look at another quotation, this time from an Australian theologian called John Dixon, who wrote, At its heart, Christianity is not a beautifully complex philosophical system like Buddhism. It's not a towering code of morals like Islam or a delicate set of rituals as some churches have presented it. Some Christian churches uh, are being referred to here. So it's not about rituals. It's not about a, a towering code of morals. Uh, and it's not a, a philosophical system. The crucial starting point for any discussion about this topic is the fact that Christianity as the word suggests, is all about a person, and the person is Jesus Christ. 
Tonight we're going to have a, a Bible-based approach. Um, we all value the Bible. Uh, we're going to look at to see what the new of what the Old Testament had to say about Jesus. Uh, and according to the New Testament writers, what did Jesus say about himself? What did his followers say about him? And how should those ideas affect us? Of course, we're using a, a Bible-based thought, and the reference there is to Second Timothy 3.16. Uh, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So what did the Old Testament say? Well, the word Jesus per se is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Of course, Jesus means Savior. Uh, and in the, the Old Testament, there are many prophecies about a Savior to come, a Redeemer that would come, uh, a servant king. Perhaps you can think of scriptures like Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, and also in Isaiah, it is mentioned that unto us a, a son would be born, a son would be given. And in the book of Daniel, it talks about the Messiah. And generally speaking, as you look at so many prophecies, uh, there is the idea that God is going to intervene in human affairs. I want to just use one uh, prophetic scripture here in Psalm 2, uh, verses 2 and verses uh, 11 to 12. Uh, as perhaps indicative of so many of the Old Testament scriptures that promised this idea of intervention. It says in Psalm 2, uh, verse 2, Rulers take counsel together, and they take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed. Here's this idea of the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah just means the anointed one. It says, now therefore, talking of a future event in verse 11, now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling, kiss or bow the knee to, or pay homage to the Son. So this is a prophecy, and you can go back and read Psalm 2, and it's a prophecy that takes us to the end of time in many ways, and it discusses this idea of the Messiah, the idea also of a king to come, and also the idea of the Son. It's a, a remarkable prophecy, and it's like so many other prophecies of which you may have read in the Old Testament. Let's continue with the, the next thought here. According to the New Testament writers, what did Jesus say about himself? This is relevant because he does explain himself in terms of references to the Old Testament. And those ideas are noted down by some of the New Testament writers, particularly the Gospel writers. So in uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse, verse uh, 44, uh, if you remember the setting for this is the road to Emmaus, Jesus is explaining to the disciples that were with him how the scriptures referred to him. And in verse, verse, uh, excuse me, verse 44, uh, he says this, Everything written about me, about Jesus in other words, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What is Jesus saying? He's referring first of all to himself and also it is a very inclusive idea everything that is written without exception any prophetic reference to the messiah to the son being born to the savior to come everything that is written in the three concepts of uh, that covers the old testament the law the prophets and the writings the psalms Everything that is written about Jesus must be fulfilled. And so sometimes when we read the book of Matthew or, or Luke or Mark or uh, whatever, uh, we get these phrases. This was done so it would be fulfilled. Every reference to the Savior to come, the Messiah, every reference to Jesus must be 
fulfilled. And then in John chapter 5 and verse 39, uh, he's talking to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees think that uh, within the scripture there is, there is a road to eternal life. They don't realize, uh, because Jesus hasn't fully explained it to them yet, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So, he says, uh, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But, he says, or and if you wish, uh, it is they that bear witness to me or about me. The scriptures testified of Jesus. They were about him. And of course, this, this matches that passage there in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, where Christ explains that all the prophecies about the Messiah that had to be fulfilled would be fulfilled in him. Let's continue. As we, we think about some of the things that were recorded uh, by the New Testament writers, particularly the Gospel writers, about things that Jesus said about himself. He said this in John 8 and verse 38, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that uh, for him there was a pre-existence even before Abraham. This is very relevant as, we, as we'll continue to see. Um, so it wasn't just a question of, of Christ existing just within the framework of, of the New Testament and the Gospel. Before Abraham was, Jesus is, is what Christ is saying. And then in John 11 and verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. This is amazing teaching from Jesus. Because up to then, people would have thought, no, if you believe in Moses, if you follow the writings of Moses, then you, you may be involved in the resurrection to come. But Christ says something entirely different. Belief is to do with him. Whoever believes in me, he says. And then it goes on in John chapter 14 and verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Up to that point, people have thought that I know the way, the truth, and the life were, were all contained in the Old Testament scriptures. But here Christ says something very, very different. I am the way, he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what's more, no one comes to the Father except through me. We may have thought there was another way to God the Father. But Christ says, no, he is the only way to the Father. Uh, he reinforces this thought in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27. It says, No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That's talking about us. The Son has chosen to reveal the Father to us. We have been chosen by the Son. It's not that through our own intellect that somehow we have stumbled across Jesus Christ. Rather, we have been chosen, just like the disciples were chosen. And then, to discuss more about his relationship with the Father, Christ says in John 10 and verse 30, and people were horrified that he said this. They thought he was speaking blasphemy. Remember what he said? He said, I and the Father are one, completely together, a oneness in God. Let's continue. Again, uh, we, we talked about you know, what did the New Testament writers say. Uh, we talked about the references to the Old Testament. Uh, we just recorded a couple of moments ago how uh, Jesus understood that he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and everything that was prophesied about him, about him had to be fulfilled because he is the Messiah. He is the Saviour. He is the Son that was promised. He is the one that intervenes for us. 
Now, his writer, his uh, followers went on to say other things that expounded more concerning who Jesus is. Here we find in John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, a very well-known passage. But you remember what John says. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Interesting thought. The Word was God. Who is this Word? What is John talking about? He goes on to say, He, the Word, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, the Word, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now later on, of course, John identifies the Word as the, the only begotten Son of God. And we'll see a scripture that refers to that as we go through. But at the moment, let's just take this idea of how Jesus Christ, uh, later revealed to be the Word that John refers to, how Jesus Christ was involved in creation. It's not just John that says this. It's recorded elsewhere. Look what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 to 17, talking of Jesus. For by him all things were created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Remember we read that before Abraham was, uh, Jesus is. He said, no, before Abraham was, I am. Remember that phrase? Note this. He is before all things. It, he goes back even further than we can imagine. Of course, Jesus is not a created being. Let's remember this. He, he became flesh and dwelt among us. But as we read this, we can understand that Jesus is the Word, the Word that was involved, the Word that was there from, from the beginning, so to speak. Not a created being. Uh, for by him all things were created. He wasn't one of the all things that was, that was created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1 and 2 says a similar thing. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom he also created the world. So when you take those scriptures together, John 1, verses 1 to 3, Colossians 1, 16 to 17, and Hebrews 1 and verse 2, we can see this connection. Jesus is involved in the creation. In fact, he is the creator. He is the Word that was and is God. Let's look at some other thoughts here. Uh, I mentioned we get to the, the verse that explains how the Word became flesh, and here it is, John 1 and verse 16. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Uh, this is John writing, talking perhaps of the transfiguration. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word became flesh. Uh, this is referred to again in Philippians 2 verses 5 and 8. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, made himself nothing, being born in the likeness of men. So what is this saying to us about Jesus? How Jesus is the Word, the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the Word that was with God from the beginning, the Word that was God and is God. Jesus and the Father are one. Fascinating concept, isn't it? Let's continue. What did his followers say once again the same idea hebrews 1 to 2 we were there already it says god has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things we read that through whom also he created the world and this son this son is the radiance of the glory of god and the exact 
imprint of his nature. It says something similar in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. In fact, the same Greek word is used there with the word for imprint and the word for image. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So what is it saying? If you want to understand what God is like, uh, if you want to follow God, how do we know what God is like? Well, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's what it says here. If we want to understand how we follow God, we follow Jesus. Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, who is the exact imprint of the very nature of God. Because Jesus is the Word who was with God and the Word who is God. This is what the Bible explains to us concerning who Jesus is. Again, we're looking at this phrase about what did his followers say. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, When Christ had offered uh, for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's talking about Jesus uh, uh, and the, the sacrifice that he would make, uh, the sacrifice for us. And this is the book of Hebrews. It talked about the idea how there used to be high priests uh, who would go and make sacrifices for the people, uh, and they would make sacrifices of animals and bulls. But if you must remember, or please do remember, you know, the, the blood of such sacrifices would never take away sin. It is only the sacrifice of Christ that takes away sin. I know sometimes people have speculated, you know, would the, the sacrificial system ever come back in some way? You know, would it come back perhaps at uh, the beginning uh, of uh, a future with Jesus? But I don't think so. Why, why would that happen? Because here it says uh, that Christ has offered for all time a single sacrifice. The sacrificial system is not going to come back. Jesus is. The sacrifice for us. It goes on to say in First John chapter two, verses one to two, if anyone does sin, and of course we all do sin from time to time, we have an advocate. So Jesus is an advocate for us, and of course we have another <laughs> advocate, the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus is our advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the only righteous one. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the one who is the complete atoning sacrifice for us. There is no other atoning sacrifice. We don't need to have uh, physical sacrifices ever again because Jesus has sacrificed himself for us. He is the, uh, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, not just for us alone, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the promised Saviour to come. That is mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures. Again, we're looking at this idea, what did his followers say about him? Uh, taking up uh, from First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says this, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Talking of Jesus. He was manifested in the flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. This is like perhaps a an old hymn that perhaps was sung at the time of the New Testament church. It's a, a wonderful thought, isn't it? Uh, and the words to some extent mirror uh, what is in uh, the GCI Statement of Beliefs. Remember what it says in the GCI Statement of Beliefs concerning Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, was born of the Virgin Mary, being fully God, 
Jesus being fully God and fully human, and he is the perfect revelation of the Father. Once again, if we want to know what God is like, where do we look? Well, we look to Jesus, and also the perfect representative of humanity. He died for us. He suffered for us. And of course, he rose for us. And he is returning for us. Let's continue the GCI statement of beliefs, talking of Jesus. He suffered and died on the cross for all human sin. He was raised bodily on the third day and ascended to heaven. Standing in for all humanity before the Father, Jesus Christ provides the perfect human response to God. Since he died for all, all died in him, and all will be made alive in him. Again, we're discussing tonight who is Jesus, and we're just looking at a, a number of scriptures. This could be uh, a whole series of Bible studies. Uh, we're just making it a, a short uh, Bible study this evening, just to, remembering, just to be remembering a, a few key points in this question, to answer the question, who is Jesus? So what did his followers say to continue the thought there? Well, Paul said this, and Paul puts it so neatly, I think we, we need to remember the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. And all our scriptures tonight were from the English Standard Version of the Bible, unless otherwise mentioned. For Paul says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, talking of the Corinthian church, that was a very confused church, that while I was with you, I, I resolved to know nothing except this one thing I would preach, this one thing I would know, this one thing I would live always in my life. Uh, I, I resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the message the message rendition puts it this way. I, I deliberately kept it plain and simple. I, we like the plain and simple truth, don't we? G first, Jesus and who he is. Then Jesus and what he did. Not just for us, but for all humanity. Jesus crucified. Of course, this is the message of grace, isn't it? That, that we preach the grace of Jesus Christ in all that we say and all that we do and all that we, we testify towards. We testify of Jesus and we preach him. Sometimes people ask, you know, why do we keep talking about Jesus? Well, it's what Paul did. It's what his followers did. They would point to Jesus. And it's also what the Holy Spirit teaches us to do, to point to Jesus always. And we do this. Let's resolve among our congregations to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. How should that affect us? The things that we've just been discussing, the fact that the Old Testament pointed to uh, a saviour to come, that a son would be born, that there would be an intervention in human affairs by God. And this idea that, that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and the idea that his followers would describe him in, in all kinds of terms as being the one who was involved in creation. Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Lord. How should that affect us? Well, obviously, uh, there are sometimes heresies involving Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, the, the uh, early church age was full of different kind of heresies. Some thought that, well, perhaps he had not really come in the flesh, and aspects of Gnosticism was involved in that. And remember, John teaches in 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, that Jesus did come in 
the flesh. The word was made flesh. And if someone is saying something different to that, we should be very, very careful and avoid such teaching. Uh, the Ebionites, you've probably heard of them before, uh, they perhaps wondered, you know, was Jesus really more human than anything else? And what Jesus really had to do was to fulfill the law of Moses. Uh, and then once he had fulfilled the law of Moses, then he would have been justified. And really he was more human than God. So he wasn't fully God and fully human, just a bit more human, perhaps. Or, or Sabellianism, you, you probably have heard of that before, the idea of how God is just involved in three modes of thinking. In fact, sometimes it was expanded into different ideas of, of ages of time. You know, there was the, the age of the Father, the age of the Son, uh, and now some might say we're in the age of the, the Holy Spirit. God is not divided in that way. Let's remember we can be confused in these things. And some, even in ancient times, thought that Jesus uh, was only divine by degree. He wasn't fully divine. He was more divine than the apostles uh, but because the Spirit rested on him. But he wasn't completely divine. Uh, other concepts. Uh, Arianism, you, I'm sure you've heard of that before, um, that some wondered was the Son of God just a title that was given to Jesus out of honour, uh, but actually he was a created being, they thought, uh, but not of the same essence and nature of God, and therefore they said, well, Jesus is, is not co-eternal, he is in a realm all by himself, a little bit like a, a demigod. Of course we don't believe that. Some have even suggested that uh, perhaps he was human, but not in a way that is similar to us, but in some way that is different from us. If you ever hear of such teachings, please avoid those kinds of heresies. Jesus, the Word, the Word that was in the beginning with God, and the Word that was God, the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us fully divine fully human any teaching that takes us away from that concept is questionable so as we think about who jesus is of course there are wrong concepts about him that we should avoid again how should that affect us as we think of who jesus is now, we, we all say that we believe that Jesus is Lord. So when we say that we believe in the Lord Jesus, what is it, what is it that we are, we are actually saying? Well, I want to make a suggestion that if we believe in Jesus, we are saying that we give ourselves away to Jesus. We give all of us to him. Our thinking, our hearts, <laughs> No, our mind, how we feel, our, our emotions, our, our behavior. We hold nothing back because Jesus is Lord. And, and that word Lord, by the way, uh, it was often used in Greek times, uh, going back to New Testament times and thereafter, the concept of Lord being uh, someone who has a complete influence over every aspect of your life. And Jesus does. And we give him that view of ourselves. We give ourselves away to Jesus. We give everything to him. And if we say we believe in the Lord Jesus, then our will is surrendered to his will. Our thoughts, our desires, they become subservient to his thoughts and his desires. And we give our life completely into his hands. So if we say we believe in the Lord Jesus, this is what we are saying. We're not holding anything back. We give everything to him. Let's continue the thought. Again, when we say we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying this, 
that our dreams, our hearts, all these emotions, all those ideas, our ambitions, our aspirations, we give them to Him. Our lives are now claimed completely by Him, and we belong to Jesus. This is what we're saying. And this Jesus is none other than the historical Jesus of the New Testament, whom we recognize as Christ, the Messiah, the prophesied one, and whom we also recognize as the Word made flesh, God incarnate. Now, those ideas are reflected in various scriptures. Just uh, for a few moments, let's look at a couple of those scriptures. This is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Remember, Paul was writing to some people who are insistent that perhaps we should continue with some of the, the laws of Moses. And, and Paul is responding and he's saying, what we've got to do is to grow more into the image of Jesus Christ. So he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, we all, we who have unveiled faces because the veil has been lifted, if you remember, we with unveiled faces contemplate the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Let's remember what happened, of course, in Genesis, how we were made in the image of God. Remember that whole story in the book of Genesis? No, God says, let us make mankind in our image. And what happens? Man and women are created in his image. And what happens? We, we are expelled from the Garden of Eden because we disobeyed God. And when we are expelled from the Garden of Eden, we, we no longer understand fully who God is. We, we have lost the image of God. Well, Jesus has come. Jesus has been sent. Jesus has arrived. Jesus is the only image of the invisible God. And so, if we want to, in a sense, fulfill you know, why we were born, we were born in the image of God, what do we do? Well, we follow Jesus. He is the one. He is the image of the invisible God. And we become like him. And this is what the scripture is saying. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, by the way, <laughs> who is the Spirit. Jesus Christ here is identified as the Spirit. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10. Uh, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of of its creator. We've been reading all these ideas. No, Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the one who holds everything together. Jesus is the sustainer. And here we read, we are being renewed in knowledge, in, in how we think and in how we react after the image of its creator. And we are being transformed into that image, as we just read, with ever-increasing glory. Again, how should that affect us? Well, we all know Second Peter 3, 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Sometimes Christians have interpreted the scripture as meaning... Uh, grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we think the more we know, the better it is. But know what it says. Grow in the grace, the kindness, the love, the outgoing concern that Jesus has given to us. Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Well, thank you for listening to me tonight. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Gavin will be back with his next study. 
And uh, next week, of course, uh, we also have the various prayer meetings that uh, are every second Wednesday. And this coming weekend, we have different services and we have the YouTube on uh, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Please join me now in a closing prayer. Wonderful Father, we thank you for who Jesus is. We thank you that he is the Word made flesh. We thank you so much for the fact that Jesus lives in us. Thank you for the wonderful Holy Spirit. Thank you that the Spirit has been sent into our lives that we may glorify Jesus and you in everything that we may do. Thank you that you have heard our prayer. Thank you that you have guided the study tonight. And thank you for being with us and thank you for your love and for your concern. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again, everyone. Until we meet again, God bless.